fiction, but science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. Miss Jennifer Ann Gordon is here for your Halloween pleasure. Oh my gosh. I love, I love that I just got like a little Halloween intro. Hi, Alan. I always feel bad that I call you Alan and you always introduce yourself as Al. And I'm just yeah. like, you're like, oh, oh Alan. Like I'm uh, some old granny. Well, you are. <laughs> I am. I am some old granny. No, I just, I, yeah, I'm very, um, very loose. My image is much more than an I am, you know, Al. I mean, look at those stupid photos that I, I hate photos. Did you like those photos? Your headshots? Yeah. They were really good. Oh, God. I especially liked the, I remember you, because you sent eight, and I liked the third one because you had kind of like a smoldering side eye. Well, that's what, so, <laughs> I, I to another writer I sent to as well, and he said, he picked number three, and he said, it's sinister. I like that. Yeah. So I went with one, three, and eight. So that they got the most views. But I cannot stand my looks. So it's just terrible. I look at these things and I think, how did I get so old? You know, I think that. I mean, I think that every single day of my life, I had just had to color <laughs> my hair last night because I realized I'm doing an in-person event tomorrow and I'm doing a, a panel with other writers and I think I'm the oldest one by far on the panel and I'm like, uh oh, I'm going to look like their mom. <laughs> Yeah, here's mother intros. No, yeah, yeah here's mother. You're Mother's far, here with us. You're today. far too young. What are you, 25 now or something? Yeah, let's go with that. Yeah, that so sounds nice. It's the big deal. Now, <laughs> speaking of old, <laughs> I thought you were going to say speaking of a big deal. <laughs> well, so I was going to say speaking of. No, this isn't about making people feel good. This is not a show of promotion. <laughs> this is a show of conversation. So we've got a. Um, an author returning. It's been a while. As he's been so busy. He's got so many things going on. It's we don't we don't we're re- really low on the list here. So it, we finally got chosen. So uh, new book, Jack of All Trades, and of course it's Jack Wells. So there you go. Hey Jack. Hey guys. Glad to be back. Hey Jack. I'm excited. And I I'm so jealous that like Jennifer gets Halloween pleasure because I want Halloween pleasure. Like I, I I heard that and I was like I want that. No. Well, I have some of that? we can we can work that in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. That's, then, we're, then we're good. That's on the uh, edited version. <laughs> then I'm really happy to be here. We'll go. We'll put it that way. Yeah. It, it's got a happy ending. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. oh boy. <laughs> boy, then, we went there. We do you, went there. What oh, do you yeah. do on Halloween then? What do, do you do? Anything different on Halloween? Does Halloween turn you on? Do you kind of? Oh yeah. Like that's like you know because I mean I've got kids so we're we're all about Halloween anyways but that's always been my favorite holiday like I kind of lean into it real heavy and I mean I grew up with Nightmare Before Christmas and all that stuff and so that's still a very big part of my Halloween experience so I've got all the decorations we've got fantastic costumes we we really go all in but yeah it's 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 Halloween starts early in this household we'll just go with that I've started to just never take my Halloween decorations down but. Like, and I'm getting there. I put them up yeah, last that's... year, and I was just like, well, they're so cool. I'm just going to keep this weird skull right here in my <laughs> living room. And, uh, yeah. It, it We're slowly easing into that as the kids get older. It's just that's this is a year-round thing. We're just going to celebrate it every day. Yeah. That's funny. You know, had the, had the uh, Church of Satan magas, you know, Peter Gilmore on, and, and uh, even he doesn't like Halloween that much. What? How yeah. can he not? It's well, he does, seems no, like a crime. He, he does two weeks, but. I just couldn't imagine. Just I think it's funny because Mr. Satan himself. <laughs> He's kind of like, eh, you know, it's so yeah, it's, passive, it's, whatever, you know, right? you know, it's so 1990s. Yeah. Whatever. I do it for yeah. the kids, but you know, 
that's not really a big deal. I'd rather hang out with my dog, you know. And it's oh, it's funny, God. you know. And then I get some writers on, and they're all like, "Oh my God, it's a way of life." Yeah, <laughs> it is. It 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 really. And in this circle, in this kind of indie environment, it totally is a way of life. I mean, everybody's posting, and I, I just love it. It just brings this joy out in me. Why? But what do you think it is that that um, gets pe- so people, so many people, so into it more than I think I've ever seen in my life? I think it's just the lifestyle. I think it's just the, the, the especially on the on, with the online authors and the indie authors, I think it's just that sense of community. I mean, we're already a community in the fact that we're all writing or attempting to write and attempting to break into this um, this writing scene. But I think it's just that next level of kind of this found family that we're all like, hey, we're all into this stuff. And whether we're into the, the lighthearted side of it or the, like super dark, heavy stuff, we're all kind of related to that way. It's it's a found family kind of thing, and I and I, I dig it because I'm all about fam, found family, so I love it. Yeah, I've heard that rumor. <laughs> heard that about me? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard that. You know. Yeah. Yep. So, what do you go dressed up as? Well, I usually go steampunk, kind of the steampunk western vibe. I've gone as Darth Vader. Sometimes I go all in as like something super like creepy. I don't know. It just depends on what my mood is that year. I'm debating this year. I've got several costumes on the hook. I'm not sure which one I'm going to choose. It. I will probably choose the the day before. Why don't you go as like Boy George? I could. Um, I'm not quite that skinny, but I could. I could try. He's been putting on weight, so don't worry about you it. You can use you contour really makeup. Me, you Do you really want to hurt me? You know. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll tumble for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So what's so what's going on here? Now you've got a new book out. So when did this where did this come from? It seemed like you were doing other things and all of a sudden you kind of go off the radar and then you come back on and you've got a new book. Jack of all trades. So what is Jack of all trades? So Jack of all trades is this thing that I've been working on kind of in secret. It's a collection of short stories and I do short stories with heavy air quotes because I have a really difficult time writing something that's actually short. Um, I don't have a lot of time to write. So when I do write, I get really invested into the world and I I have a hard time keeping it brief. Um, And so short stories is heavily quoted, but it's, it's really just a question of of short stories that are kind of my homage, if you will, to some of the classics of horror fiction, primarily Poe and Dickens. And I I find that I'm apparently I'm, I'm, I have a, a niche and that niche is to write um, old school horror uh, outside of today's era, you know, going back to the 1800s, 1900s, the early, um, like 19, mid 1900s, especially. Uh, that apparently, that's just my my theme. It's what I do well. I don't know if it's the vernacular. I don't know if it's the research, but I find a lot of joy in that. And apparently, that's kind of an underserved area of horror or fiction, if you will. So it's yeah, it's my homage it's my hope to bring something a little dark and a little classic um huh. i really try to write eloquently i try to capture the feel of those old stories where it was very verbose you had sentences that kind of seemed like they went on forever and they weren't run on sentences but there's a different style of writing to those old classic stories than there is now it was, it's a lot more punchy now it's short punchy sentences where before it was very long kind of poetic prose i'm kind of leaning that way that's what i'm trying to bring back or lean into anyway so that is my offering into to that genre because we've got it's kind of a hot topic right now splatterpunk was kind of this um just trending on socials because apparently a lot of people were getting offended by it which i thought was interesting because it's splatterpunk it's gonzo like you you know what you're getting into when you get if into the this genre splatter it, is in the right? genre like <laughs> how can you be surprised that it's like shocky and schlocky like, like, oh my how, gosh it was so <laughs> bloody and violent yeah and so then there's writers that do that very well and, and my hat is off to them and that's not me you know so i'm i'm like hey here's this underserved but what i view as this underserved niche in this in, in the horror genre which is that old school kind of evocative horror old hammer horror if you will as opposed to the the very in your face stuff you know people do that very well and i have more power to them i'm going to stick with this thing that i do well i love quiet horror i really i guess it's my favorite as well and i think it's because maybe growing up on like you know, Dracula and Wuthering Heights. Yes, and yes. I want everything I read to be coated in fog. And I want the yes. pages to smell damp or be falling apart under my fingers. I just love it. Right. Take me there. Yeah. Don't just tell me about it. Take me there. So that's my attempt with these stories. 
is to really transport the reader outside of a modern era. Most some of the stories take place in, in a modern time, but most of them don't, and really transport you back to a time where there weren't cell phones, there wasn't all this technology. People relied on their wits. People relied on who they knew. And um, to me, that makes a more effective kind of thriller or horror tale when you don't have the benefits of technology. You don't have GPS. You don't have 911. Those things don't exist, you know. So to me, it makes it more visceral experience, more real experience. And so that's, yeah, I, I love stories that take place in old times because that's, I don't know, to me it's compelling. You see yourself as one of these, um, I don't know, how do you say, so when you're writing something at back in those days, your characters, are you your characters? Like, you know, or do you fit into them, feel them? Some of them. You do? Yeah, so in Monochrome Noir, like each of the characters in that series, I it was a segment of me. With these stories, there are aspects of me, but the, the cool thing about this one, especially this collection, was that, this is the first time I've really kind of stepped out of the boundaries of myself and said, okay, this character, some of these characters I have no connection with whatsoever. They just came into being, and there's not a single aspect of them within me, which I thought was interesting, because I think every writer puts a little bit of themselves into their work, whether it's sarcasm, whether it, you know, it's, it's humor, whether it's sultriness, whatever, whatever it happens to be, whatever their defining trait is, or there's some, some facet of their personality gets injected into these characters. And some of these characters... They're not me. And I think that was really kind of a defining moment for me as an author when I'm like, yep, that is not a figment of myself. I'm not writing from experience. And it, it's, a, it's a challenge. But it was, yeah, it's pretty awesome. But there are, if you read through it, you'll, and you, if you know me especially, there are characters, especially in the big one, See No Evil, the main character is very much me, where I feel, I've always felt like I've kind of been born in the wrong century. Like I should have been born in Victorian England. I should have been alive during those times. I, I've felt that for a long time, and so I think a lot of those aspects shine through in that character. Yeah, you're a vampire. Uh, yeah. Vampire. <laughs> we'll go with that. Vampire, yes. Vampire. Uh, yes. Jack, do you, so this is obviously like a departure for you in some ways because it's not, you're not one of the characters. Was that, free, like, how freeing did that feel? to write characters that weren't connected to you at all. Did you find that Very you were free. able to, like, take crazy choices and take risks? Yeah, and I was able to kind of write characters that I have – it's funny because I'm on a podcast and we laugh about – because they'll, they'll talk about a certain thing, and I'm like, yeah, I have, exper- have real-world ex- real experience with that. I have real-world experience with a lot of things, and it's kind of a kind of a running joke at this point. But it was kind of nice to – dive into these these professions or these mindsets or even these genders um, that I have no experience with whatsoever and to try to write them in a believable fashion. So I think more than, more than the monochrome noir, I think this book allowed me to really expand my ability as an author um, and, and kind of test my limits and see if I could actually pull these off. And of course, that's ultimately up to the readers whether I did or not. But I gave it a good college try to say, okay, I'm writing something that I have literally no knowledge about. All I have is some assumptions, some research, and a whole lot of gumption, you know? Do you Mm. like researching? Love it, actually. Yeah. I always think I'm going to like it, and then I start researching, and I'm like, oh, no, let's just put that right back in modern times. (laughs) I go down these (laughs) rabbit holes, like... Like I, in in researching for See No Evil, which is a, like the the it's a novel that's kind of buried in this collection. Um, I found out a, a lot about Victorian society. Like for instance, one of the fascinating things to me is that the post, the mail, was delivered up to twelve times a day. Like the same residents would have a post uh, a postal worker, not necessarily the same one, potentially, but not always, visit like every hour, and so you had families that were living in London that would do, because this is, I mean, the, the telegraph had, was was in existence until the telephone was in existence at this time, but nobody, very few people had access to it. So you had families on opposite sides of London that were communicating via letters, and they'd write a letter, and the post my guy would come and get it, and he'd deliver it within a couple hours to the other residents across town. They'd have time to write a response, and it would get delivered back the same day. So that was their texting, if you will. That was their correspondence back then, which was to me is fascinating. Like that, you have you know, you, you, when you look at the post office today, you're like, yeah, they drive around in trucks. But it was like in London, it was the largest employer in London. There, they had the most employees because it was such a burgeoning business, such a booming business 
to to correspond with your with the your loved ones. That was the only way to do it outside of seeing them face to face. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So the research to me can be very fascinating so long as it has pertinence to the story or that I can mention it in an offhand way. I think it's I think it's great. I love doing the research. I love going through the papers. I love going through the time because uh, if you immerse yourself into that time period, it's going to come out a better story. I think. So, Al, let me ask you a question. Do you find in doing that research that you identify more with the characters, that you kind of get – I think, cause for me, doing that research kind of gets me into that, that mind mindset, if you will, that frame of mind. Yeah. Do you find that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because yeah. you can understand them. You can understand where they're coming from or why they might act or react certain ways to certain things because – you start to you see you see how they live. It's not just if you if you just see it from a distance, you don't realize what they go through their full day. It's not like it's so easy to fall into making your character like today, but only back then. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you, right. you know, compared to how you live today, and that's where I think authors make mistakes. I certainly see it a lot on streaming because you know they they use today's you know the way we speak today, the phrases, the right. slang of 2020. Even just the rhythm of the way we speak now is so much different than the way people it actually is. spoke. Yeah, yep. but, you know, you'll see it in these shows that are supposed to be 100 years old, and yet people are behaving like it's 2020, but they're dressed like it's 1800. You know, it's just, and it kind of rubs me the wrong way, and I usually lose interest in it because, as soon as they start saying phrases like, you know, uh, sorry for your loss or something, and you're like, oh, please. Um, yeah. It just kind of drives me uh, because I think it's out of touch with who they were. And if you really want to understand them, you, you got to really understand where they're at the best you can, you know. Agreed. And that's what I try to do with, with these time period books is that, I again, I want to transport the readers to this time period so ergo – as far as to the best of my ability, everything needs to be authentic to that time period. And so that's part of the joy of the research is not only what events were transpiring during this time, you know, in, in that part of the country, but what did people say? How did they talk? Yeah. How did they correspond? You know, and so you know, there's an instance in that story where it's epistolary. So it's, 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 it's a letter that is being read or it you was know, part of the story. And I was researching old Victorian letters that people were sending back and forth to each other and just found it eminently fascinating how they corresponded and the words they used and the, the things that were important to them. And so I really tried to capture that because I, I do want authenticity. You know, I mean, yes, it's fiction. Yes. The story that's taking place is obviously not real, but it's surrounded by real world events. And I don't ever want to be like a history teacher and, and, you know, go into Tom Clancy levels of detail, but I also do want to throw little snippets in there of, Hey, this is what life was like in that time so that it helps the reader get into that mindset too, and kind of repose them out of the 20th, 21st century and and takes them into that time period. I think it's very important. I think it's really important. If you want to truly enjoy a story. I, I feel like it's really important, especially for, genre fiction especially for horror for yes. science fiction for anything because we're already battling as horror authors this kind of well it's not real obviously this isn't real this isn't reality but to make it truly unsettling for the reader it has to be as real as possible Read. so you yeah. can believe in the unreality of it and that's what i love about this i, I keep re- referring to this one, but See No Evil is kind of the piece de resistance in this in this book. It's, it's huge. It's, I mean, it's basically a novel that's interspersed throughout this collection. And that is exactly right. I throw real-world events with fictional elements that are transpiring because I want to give it that added sense of realism and horror. It's, hey, this stuff was actually happening. Like, Jack the Ripper and all these things were actually happening at this time. You know, there wasn't just some cool story that we like to talk about. I mean, this was their, this was their day to day. And, you know, for the Victorian citizens, there was this a huge societal fear. They were living in this like grip of fear that, Oh my God, there's these killings that are happening. Who's next? Who's next? Who's next? And then juxtapose that with all these inventions that are coming down the pike and all this progress that's coming down the pike. It, to me, it was just a very, fascinating interesting time time period and that's why i chose to, to set this particular story 
in that time period because there's so much happening all at once. And yeah, I, I wanted it to feel real. Yeah, I find that with any like I'm I'm doing stuff in the 50s and 60s now, and it's amazing how much is going on in a certain time period. Like we forget as time passes. I think all of the things going on today and all of the stresses and the weird stuff going on and the tension and the wars and stuff. I think that, um, you know, in 50 years it's all gone and most of it's forgotten and that generation won't understand how we're living today or how we're feeling. Do you know what I'm saying? That's a, that's a good point. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of, um, we're kind of taught, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent. We're taught to look at the past with rose tinted glasses, right? That it's, Oh, it was simpler times and everything and everybody was so friendly. You know, you look back at the reality and no, no. it was not simple times <laughs> by any means, no, you know. And, no. Yeah. No, and I can see why older generations than than myself, even when I see uh I can see why they thought back in the even like in the sixties that everything was going to hell. You know, they're shooting the president and and uh, Cuba and all of the things, the race riots and all the yeah. all the tension and the uh, Hell's Angels or not the uh, what's the thing I was thinking of the uh, Manson family and stuff, all yeah. of the yeah. stuff that was going on, rock and roll music and Woodstock. They must have thought, oh my God, the world's oh, Kent State, Ohio, like all these things that are happening in the country that are like it's appalling to the people at that time. And now we're like, we're kind of living that same thing. It's like, Oh my gosh, look at all this crazy stuff. And it's, yeah. it was no, cra- it was no less crazy back yeah. then. I think it's just crazy. That matches the time and, yes. and, the, and the current technology and everything. So personally, yeah. I, I, I kind of put it to that. I try to think that that's how it's going to be and it'll all work out. You know, I do like looking back at the old times because we do know how it worked, how it, how it went. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. So there's a comfort to that that we don't really we have. Survived it before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't we don't know that now. Like we, uh, there's no comfort in today's unrest as compared to the, you know what happened after the Jack the Ripper in the 1800s and all that, right? Yep. Yep. You know exactly. Do you actually feel your characters then? I do. Um, I so it, it's kind of a, a byline for me that I the, one of the reasons that I write so slowly and that I have such a slow output is because. Once I get invested in a story, I'm all in, you know, and so I, I don't know how it is for other, re- other authors other than what I've seen them post, but I mean, I get fully, fully invested in these characters. So I, and not just the characters, but the time period. So I find myself thinking in 1800s or early 1900s vernacular. I find myself trying to look at a situation as they would look at it. It, it kind of overtakes my life and it's, it's great on one hand and it's really frustrating on another because I can't get it out of my head. And so I go in these spurts where I, I write and I write and I write and I get invested and I get sick of it because it's taking me away from what is actually happening in my life, in real life. And I, I kind of lose track of it, I got blinders on. And so then I go back to real life and life is good and I kind of forget about my stories for a while and then they eventually pull me back. And all of a sudden I'm now in 1892 and I'm not living in today's you know, I'm not living now. I'm living then, and it yeah, it's it's an interesting thing for me. And I and I can't speak for how other authors do it, but for me, I get I go all in. I I don't know how else to do it. Well, I love hearing that as a fellow very slow writer. Uh, you know, you're here, yay! yay. <laughs> you know, I, you look online and you see people, and they're like, I, I put out four books this year, and I'm just like, how do you do it? Oh, did you do? How yeah, did you do it? And still like yeah. sleep and have a life and have a family. Um, but so I'm wondering, Jack. Because you do go all in, what's going on in your mind before you start a project? Has the project been percolating in your head for months or years before it finally develops into a story? Or do you just get an idea and then you immediately, you know, hyper-focus from there? Some of them. Like Monochrome Noir, I've been kicking around in my head for years. And, like, I kind of tell people, like, I knew the ending of that story long before I ever wrote it. And I wrote the story to get to that ending. And it turned out exactly like I wanted it to, um, where See No Evil, which is like roughly 50,000 words, I thought I had an idea of what it was going to go, and it went completely differently. And so I was I was at that point just kind of along for the ride. So it depends on the story that's being told. But I, most often, I already have them in my head. I have a general idea of how it's going to play out, and then it's just up to me 
me to get from A to Z, right? Fill in, get the filler. I know how it starts. I know how it ends. I just got to get there. I just got to fill in everything else. I am currently writing um, a standalone sequel to Monochrome Noir, and I know exactly how it's supposed to start. I know exactly what I want the story to tell. But in this instance, for the first time in a long time, I have no idea how it's going to end, and that's both exhilarating and terrifying. I was just about to ask if that was enjoyable. <laughs> yes and no. Uh, mostly no, because I, I – and I know there's all this debate about pantser versus plotter, right? Do you fly by the seat of your plant, pants, or do you plot it out ahead of time? And I'm, I kind of thread that needle. I do a little bit of both. I will, I will do a general outline of what I want the story to, how I want the story to unfold, um, how I want it to end, usually, and some of the points that I want to touch along the way. But once I'm writing, I, all, I, all I know is I need to get to this point. It doesn't necessarily, I don't know how I'm going to get there. And the story kind of takes me there, which I think is, is enjoyable. So for me, it's kind of a, a little mix of both. I'm a little bit of a pantser, a little bit of a plotter, and I love it because it's, it's the best of both worlds. Mm. I like to call that being a, a flashlight discovery author. So you can yes. see as far as your flashlight beam. Yes. But you, like that. So you, can, you know kind of what's going on. <laughs> mm. You know, the general idea. The general idea. Yeah. And you might have like a, a handwritten map that you're looking at going, okay, I think I'm supposed to take a left up here, but I don't really know what's going to be around that corner. Right. Yes. I consider Absolutely. myself an asser because I don't wear pants. <laughs> yeah. Just like just <laughs> butt cheeks on yeah. the. On like yeah. The, yeah. Are you assless chaps? Yeah. Or are you assless chaps. chaps. So, you know, I fly chaps. by the seat of my ass, not my <laughs> pants, because I don't have any. Anyway, that's oh. bad. Anyway, do, are you like Daniel Day Lewis then? Or like, do you like live in the period the whole time? So you dress up and uh, act, and even when you're not writing, you everybody has to call you the character, and you act like. I wish, kinda, <laughs> like to an extent, in my own mind, yes. And I and I know my kids get real frustrated because I'll start spouting vernacular like appropriate or period appropriate vernacular, and they're looking at me like, "What are you saying right now?" You know. And, <laughs> And I'm like, oh, right, right, right. Sorry, I'm, I'm in character. I apologize. Okay, but boomer. I, oh, right? No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, Daddy's having a stroke. <laughs> yeah. Do we need to call 911? You know, yeah. For me, again, like I said, I always feel, I've always felt like I was born in the wrong century. And I, so, yeah, I'll kind of listen to music at the time period. I'll, I'll make drinks from the time period. I don't, I don't go all in like, oh, I'm dressing, like how they dress or anything. But I do try to get myself as much as, as possible within a reason into that frame of mind, into that time period. Because otherwise, like you said, I'm telling an old story in modern, it, with modern methods, and that to me is not, not acceptable. Right, right. No, that doesn't work. Yeah, I do that too. I mean, I don't dress up, but I, I'll have uh, television shows and radio shows. I'll do yes. everything from that time period so that I yes. get into – uh, it's it's amazing what you pick up too, because especially game shows and stuff, and and you pick up phrases or jokes that they make, and then you search it out to find out what they what they meant, so you know what they were joking about. You know, I it's kinda... always sex. <laughs> wow, well, just yeah. About. <laughs> well, I, what I love about the Victorians, especially, is they had some really cool sayings. Like they had the, the case of the morbs, like morbidity. You know, where they were like. You know, and now we're like, oh, it's, they're, they're just being gothic. They're being emo. And that was like, their, that's what they used to refer to it. They had some really cool sayings back in the day. And it's funny how the sayings may change over time, but the intent and the feeling never does. We're still human at the end of the day, and we're still into the same. Oh, my. We were, you know, 100 years ago. I think it's great. So yeah. basically, you're also saying that people have been making fun of goth kids forever. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yes. <laughs> well, this makes me feel better about my high school through my 40s. <laughs> Same. <laughs> my whole life. Yeah. <laughs> Same. <laughs> oh, it's hilarious. Well, so do, when you do this, like, um, and you kind of live through the period and you write this book, and it's all finished and it's put away now and it's, it's come out for people to read, do you find that it changes you, this process? Absolutely. Um, I'm a pretty quiet person. I'm a pretty private person. I, I just do my thing. I'm not heavy on social media. You won't see me posting a lot. I don't do a lot of like quizzes or all the things that kind of are, are popular on social media. I don't do. I'm, I mean, I work long hours as it is my day job. I'm a parent. I'm a father before anything else, you know? And so then this, this writing thing that I do, yes, I want to be successful at it. Obviously I do. I want the success without necessarily the fame though, which is, those are intrinsically tied. So that's kind of a pipe dream, but it does, it does change me because 
you know, in the in the lead up to it, I'm just writing stories that I would want to read. And I'm kind of not worried about what anybody else thinks. And then once it all comes together and it's like, oh, I have this thing that's now going to be a book, then I start freaking out. And then I start worrying. And the um, imposter syndrome kicks in real bad because I'm like, oh, this is dumb. Nobody's going to want to read this crap. You know, it's not splatterpunk. It's not smut. It's not the things that are popular right now. Nobody's going to care. And then I kind of eventually get myself out of that hole where it's like, I'm not writing it for them. I'm writing it for me, you know, and if they enjoy it, then fantastic. If they don't, oh, well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I do turn into kind of this, I'm a pretty stoic person by nature, and it it takes a lot to, to get to me, but that lead up to the point of publication, I'm freaking out because it is this whole unknown thing where you're taking this curated thing that you have built over the course of a year in all of your free time and you're throwing it out there and the, you know, and you're basically exposing a, a part of yourself because there is a part of every author in their creation. So you're exposing a part of yourself. Some people, some readers don't ever get it. They don't even see it. It's superficial only, you know, but some other readers who are really adept at reading between the lines pick up on that stuff and go, oh, I see where he's coming from. I see what his fears are or his his hurts are. And so it is kind of daunting to throw it out there and have people pick up on that subtext. Um, yeah. Yeah. It does change it. Well, that's the hardest thing, right? I mean, uh, to get over that that hump or that hill there is, is, is all the noise around you, all the people saying good things, bad things understanding non-understanding there's all that stuff out there and you and you see it instantly with social media so that's the the biggest thing to get through where you have to yes you know because if you focus on that then it takes you away from things that are important like your like your kids or your your job and like your writing and things it's it's you got it so it's probably a smart thing to do like i always say just post in the morning and walk away from the Fire and forget. Yeah, yeah. because there's just yeah. too much. Uh, people have too much to say um, nowadays, and and it's not always nice. And and the thing I always I have the attitude. It's like, why do you think people care? Like, why do why do people have to say so much stuff, especially negative, uh, with, yes. for other people? It's kind of like you don't like it, just move on. You don't have to. I, yep. You know, I, I you know look at the stuff with like Paris Hilton and all, and their kid and and all the mean things they're saying about her baby and i'm thinking i could care less about Paris Hilton. Pierce, Pierce exactly you know right who cares and, but yeah. why do people have to be so mean and they're supposed to be your fans i yeah it's just yeah. i don't get to me it's yeah to me it's don't say a lot but when you do speak say it beautifully you know make it mean something because if you're just spouting noise constantly then it eventually it's it's it, that's what it is it's just white noise you know so yeah, it's that whole you know speak softly and carry a big stick kind of thing. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm I'm not a big online presence, but if I say something, then it's because I really feel that it's important and it's coming from a place of vulnerability on my side. I'm not posting just to to up my posts and to get a bunch of likes. I don't care. I'm you know that you're that, not that there for the a, algorithm. No, I'm not. I absolutely not. I I don't think you know that there's a there's a big part of me that realizes that with the way that I write and what I write. Um, I'll never be like a huge success with this. This isn't going to be what I do full time. I'm okay with that. I'm telling stories that I want to tell that I think are important to tell. And I also am telling stories that I personally would want to read. And I think there's this really interesting dynamic, um, and not just books, but in movies and other, other media as well, where we're so expectant as a society to get what we want. Um, and, I don't really want to give readers everything that they want. I just want to give readers everything that they need, you know, because you think about, let's take Star Wars, for example, and the original trilogy came out in the 70s and 80s, and, I mean, they're essentially perfect movies, you know, and then you look in, or at least we all look at them as perfect movies with, with reflection and nostalgia, but can you honestly tell me that those movies and that tale, that narrative was positively enhanced by the original trilogy and finding out that Darth Vader was the slave kid on Tatooine who raced pod racer. You know, no, you can't. It, it, it didn't impact, it didn't improve the original story in any way, shape or form. And so it's, again, we got what we wanted as fans ish, but we didn't get what we needed. And so I'm, 
a whole, I'm very much a firm believer in that, right? People are asking me, hey, can you write an origin story for so-and-so and so-and-so? And, and so I would love to find out how they became who they were. And it's like, I, I kind of don't have any interest in that because mm -hmm. part of the allure is the mystery and that each reader takes away something different. And to them, their origin story is X. And this other reader, their origin story is Y. And that, to me, is much more powerful than anything I could potentially write. So I don't, I'm not going to give you what you want. I'm just going to give you what you need. Yeah. And I feel like, so you're saying this so beautifully, and you're saying this about your characters, but we can turn that right back around and say it about ourselves as authors. Yes, absolutely. They, we should be holding a little bit back. You know, there's plenty of authors online that they have an opinion about everything, and they let people know. But it's an yeah. opinion about everything. <laughs> and and sometimes there's authors or actors or singers, anybody in the public eye, they'll eventually say something that you wholeheartedly disagree with. And that's right. normal. But then it's hard to separate the artist and the art. Isn't So that's a frequent conversation with some close people and I and friends and stuff that is – you know, it's you look at the modern media and J.K. Rowling and other and other creators, and it's like you know, it's a very interesting dynamic where you have. It, how do you separate your love for the material versus your dislike for the person? Like H.P. Lovecraft is a good example. H.P. You know, Lovecraft the, is a perfect, example. fantastic example where he created some. I mean, this cosmic horror, he essentially created it. It's he built it, and it's fantastic. But he as a person just abysmal person terrible person and so it's this very interesting dichotomy where it's like i love his works i hate him as a human being or who he was as a human being so yeah that's a, that's a good point i think actually. it's connected and i think that we have to accept that because um it takes whoever that person is to create what they do uh, and and celebrity allows us to like we give we give a lot of we put a lot of things into people that we consider celebrities. Do you know what I mean? That we don't even mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. So and yep. because of that, when they do or say something we hate or dislike or think, oh my god, that's awful, when that happens, it shatters our thought of of that. But we should have never had it to begin with because we've we've thrown all this like we've we've created a character ourselves into who we think that celebrity is until yes. we actually find out. And and I think that's the whole problem. But in in that never meet your heroes. Yeah. Yep. It's true. Yeah. And yeah. and I've met a few yeah. and I and you get really disappointed. And the thing is because we're just humans. So I might not like a lot of who these people are, but you know, in a, it you can look at it simply if I go through the drive through and I order a uh, a burger or you go to a restaurant and you haven't it's great it's my favorite thing but if you knew the cook was you know some racist yeah. homophobe yeah. yeah you're kind of like right. so i you know i just it's, it's it's one of those things try try not to know who they are and uh accept the the work that they do you know when i find it interesting with social media especially and it's not so prevalent now although i'm pretty sure we'll see a resurgence of it soon but it was a few years ago where it was like every other post was you know i believe in this if you don't agree unfriend me you know and it's whatever happened to, to discourse whatever happened to hey just because you have an opinion on this i can respect that it doesn't mean that i agree but i can respect that your opinion is different it doesn't mean that we have to be enemies right your opinion and my opinion being different does not invalidate our own opinions. My opinion does not invalidate yours and vice versa. And I think it's very interesting that there was this kind of very black and white men mentality to things. Yeah. And it's like, all no, like we're, we're built. Yeah, exactly. All or nothing. We're built to be different. We're human. We're going to be different. Yeah. And we should be okay with that, not be not okay with that. Yeah. But you carry a big stick, so. <laughs> Wow. Stop liking it and I'll stop doing it. You know? um. yeah, I... <laughs> well, I don't know anything about Jack's big stick, and I feel like that's probably one of the reasons why I wanted to do this interview because – so, Jack, I wanted to know about your big stick. Uh, I've heard that about you, too. Not bad. <laughs> yeah. um, but, like, I, you are – you do keep to yourself on social media more than a lot of other people do. And I read Monochrome Noir and loved it. And I was very, oh, very excited so about oh um, Jack of All Trades. It, my copy's coming tomorrow. I have Yay. it on Kindle, but I wanted like a paper copy too. Uh, but this is why I want, like, I love to talk to authors and artists. And 
today's been so wonderful just getting to know you and having a real conversation instead of just reading a status update that's like, right. yes. oh, hashtag love the Victorian era by my book, which you've right. never done. No. Thank you. And I never will. <laughs> I, I, I struggle because it's like, yes, do I want to be a successful author? Of course I do. You know, who in the writing business doesn't want to be successful? But I have a, a, a full-time day job that pays the bills. I'm not a starving artist, if you will, you know. Um, but I also really struggle with the the mentality, and I'm not judging, but I do struggle with it, with the mentality of I'm going to sell books based upon something else, whether it's sensuality or crazy adventures or, you know, uh, uh, these really inflammatory posts or whatever. I'm going to drum up business that way. I don't, I don't want to be that. I want to drum up business based solely upon the strength of my writing and the stories that I tell. Because if it's anything other than that, then I don't feel like I earned it. Right. You know, like it's, I'm an author. I'm not a celebrity. I'm not uh, whatever else. I'm, I'm just this quiet guy who loves to write. And that's what I want, you know, readers to take away from us. Hey, I don't know much about this dude, but he writes really cool stuff. If that's the legacy I leave, then I will be very, very well. That's all it should be because you 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 create something. It's like the guy with the burger. It it shouldn't matter what you do in your in exactly. your private life, and it really shouldn't. And and that's kind of the the downfall with this social media. I the more people that I get following, the less I care about it because the more feedback that you don't really want to hear comes with it. It brings to mind. Um, Pink Floyd with Roger Waters and The Wall, right. where you know they became this. They, I mean, they were just the the biggest selling band at that time. And he was, you know, as, as his followers and as he they added more and more tour dates and more and more record sales. He was getting more and more disconnected yeah. from everything, you know. And I I liken it to that. I don't ever want to get to that point. I don't. I don't want to get to that burnout. Yeah. You know. So I'm I'm doing everything in my power to not. Yeah. I think the best thing you can do is probably you should be a stripper one day a week. I could. Yeah, I could do that. You know, a little, a little scratch on the side, have some fun, live on the wild side a little bit yeah. and then be quiet for the rest yeah, of the day. Yeah. Would works. you do like Victorian myself. era costumes that you would strip out of? Because I feel <laughs> yeah, like you... that would give a lot of right. clothing items yeah. to take I, off. Yeah. And it's underserved, right? You don't see a lot of or any of that, really. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, like, I always well. say, you know, like 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 Jennifer, if if Jack I helped you off a horse, yeah, but if Jack helped you off a horse, would you help Jack off the horse? Oh my gosh! Wow! Oh, well, <laughs> nicely done. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. do like to be helpful. Well, there you go. You see, as, you know, and that's and a, it's, it's a all good about literary that. citizen. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Disgusting! What a disgusting Gross. human being! Was wrong Wait, with you, you know, <laughs> we were very classy for a long time. During we we the managed day. really well for fifty minutes. For fifty I'm minutes, and then it's like, and here's the Jack off joke. And well, yeah. I've got to do something with the name Jack. Come on! I mean, that name oh, is so yeah. well used. Jack the Ripper. Jack. Oh my God! I mean, well, Jack o' Lantern. Jack. I mean, Jack the mm -hmm. Nimble. I mean, that name. It's everywhere. You know. That's actually one of the ironies of this collection jack of all trades is as an adult i'm fine with the name as a uh, young adult preteen or teen i was not fine with that name i hated my name and i wanted so bad to legally change it and i won't go into any of the selections that i had as alternatives because Ralph. in hindsight they're all uniformly terrible i just can you tell us but, one can you tell us the most pretentious one well, I can't say pretentious, but I want to be called Rex. Ooh. Oh, please. That's because of his I don't know state. why. I <laughs> don't know why. I was the, like, that's, right, I'm not a Rex. You can't look at me. either like oh, a porno name Rex, or know? the name for right? like a, a German Shepherd. T Rex. Exactly. <laughs> right. But, you know, it, me and my 14 year old brain was like, oh, that's like, yeah, that's, that's a much better name than Jack. You know, whatever. I, so this was kind of, you know, it serves two purposes. Jack of all trades is a great. Is a great um, term to say, hey, none of these stories, they're all kind of different. So it's not, I'm not hewing to any one genre. But it's also a little bit of taking the power back to say, yep, yeah, I'm embracing that name. My name is Jack. I'm okay with it now. You know, and I'm throwing it out there to the world. Yep, Jack Wells is on the cover. And Jack is, again, on the cover. 
bring it on. At this point, there's nothing I haven't heard in regards to that name. Uh, there's nothing new, <laughs> I guarantee you. So, You're my T-Rex. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, Jack, you're never going to live that down. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm never calling you Jack again. I'm yeah, going to post on I, your uh... wall every day on Facebook and be like, hey, <laughs> Rex. Hey Rex. Hey Rex. Hey Rex. Hey, Rex. Mm. Mm. With a capital T, baby. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I mean, the dinosaur's yeah. Rex. That's my dinosaur, baby. I know. What's your favorite dinosaur? T Rex. Right. <laughs> You'll never go extinct as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yep. that's no. sweet. Oh, yeah. oh gosh. See? There you go. <laughs> oh, Horror dinosaur it. porn. Yeah. Oh, there's yeah. A, there's your the underserved thing. genre. That's the underserved right? genre yeah. right there. Added in yep. like Victorian era letters. Reminiscing oh or something, you know. It's a whole genre that's just a, waiting to be that mined. That is yes. a kink. That is. <laughs> start, nobody coming. knows they have, but y'all nope. have it. I know. I didn't know I had it until we just started talking about it, and I'm like, now. yes. <laughs> oh my god, the things you hear on this show is just disgusting. I tell you what, I'm telling so you. gross. I know. Why did you make me say that? Why am I here? Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole question. At the end of it, we've learned a lot. You know. Yes, yes, you have. Uh, you know, yeah. my nipples are kind it's, of semi-hard, so that's. I remember talking about nipples in the last yeah. show. Well, so I see, love that we. Well, last time they pre Jennifer days, right? Well, there. Yes. I used to make my nipples yeah. hard just all the time, but now they're just semi-hard because smart <laughs> because is he was, sexy. Like, so sweet, you know? yeah. yeah, but smart, smart is sexy, sexy right? Apiosexual, yeah. Yes. I mean, yes. but in smart a different type of, it's not the full-on hard nipple sex. It's just the. No, it's like the subtle kind of like that it grabs you. It takes time, right? Yeah. But it's more powerful. That that gripping, yeah. all encompassing, like in your face is great for instant gratification. Yeah. But it kind of fizzles out. Oh, yeah. This is one of those enduring. Yeah, that's yeah. totally. It's kind of so. Yeah. Like you cancer. get them aroused. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. But opposite of that, yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's yeah. I'm sorry, benign, it's being not, Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's it's, it's, it's the all all encompassing. You know, stuff. I love it. It's, it's, I love it. It's love everything it, about it. And it's bad. You know, it's the. It's like the kind of love that afterwards you have to take a seaside vacation. Yeah. And then you end up, you know, like living alone in a cabin by the ocean and haunting yourself over the past. Like, remember when Rex yep. said all of those things? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Rex. <laughs> You oh, Rex. Rex. Oh, about yeah, see, nobody media. in the history of any time ever said, oh, Rex. Oh, see, the, the, well, the, now I've said There it like goes my times. point, right? <laughs> there goes my point. So, yeah, thankfully I stuck with Jack and I didn't legally change it because, oh, my God, I'd be so, yeah. yeah. Imagine Jack of all trades written by, like, Rex. Rex. Yeah. Mihoff or something. How dare you? I don't know. It would be awful. Rex, so. Rex, <laughs> Rex, Rex. Rex. Rex doesn't need a last name. No. No. It's, it's like Madonna. Rex. Rex. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Ooh. So rexual. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, my yes. God. Oh, my. This, oh, I have to, okay. I have to oh, change. Like this is going to haunt me forever. I'm going to have yep. to change my underwear. <laughs> oh, my me God. Me, too. What a week. Uh, me, too. Me, too. Wow. Oh, there you go. You see? Now, people, you can yeah. send in for those underwear. We can sell them. That's right. <laughs> yes. Yep, starting an OnlyFans based off of this. this well, interview. Now, now you could do it, Mr. Stick. I don't know about that. Well, we could keep your face covered. We can just do all the there work. There you go. There you go. There you go. Well, anyway, so how, mask on. How, how do people That's find right. you? Like, what's going on, Mr. Rex? Like, we've got so the, social media, yeah. website, uh, porno site, OnlyFans, what? Yeah, my only fans is buy my books. No, I um again, I don't have a lot of presence, and I keep telling myself, hey, you should really get on this thing of getting your own website so you can kind of keep people in the loop. And ain't nobody got time for that. So I'm on Facebook, um, Jack Wells. You'll usually find my ugly mug straight up there. Um, I typically forget to shave when I take my selfies, and so I Even look better. a little scraggly. Yeah, that yeah. Good. Um, <laughs> and then Instagram is my only other footprint at the moment jack underscore wells underscore other and that's the only haunts that i have at the moment i don't have a lot of those are the time good ones and or patience yeah. yeah the other one's just kind of like, eh. like what do you want to be on twitter or x or... i'm not going to be on no. tiktok that oh, ain't me tiktok so, come on yeah. oh alan's been trying to get us to understand <laughs> tiktok for I, I don't understand it. I'm old. Well, it would be old. rectual. I'd have rectual. to, like, really lean into it. Yeah. You'd have to go full dinosaurs reading your books. Totally. Just, like, yeah. 
Yeah. I don't, I don't know what it does anyway. I mean, I've got 70,000 I hit today and you know what? What does that do? Nothing. I struggle keeping up with the two that I oh, have. Yeah, but I just, and I, I ignore them and you get more. Right. It's exactly. weird. It's like I, I'm rude and I ignore people and I have a terrible show and I write awful books and they still hey, keep following. Hey, your show's Man, not Alan, terrible. you're just the worst. No, it's just, it's just <laughs> awful. I, I absorb oh, it, that. It's just, it's just, you know, it's great. But I find that the more that I, the more that I put myself on line, the less myself I am. You know, I'm, I'm taking away from my kids, my, my work, my, my own just general self who is like, instead of posting about this life that I'm living, I'm just going to go live it. And I don't really feel obligated to share or show off. I'm, I'm not a show off kind of person anyways. I'm just going to go do these things. And it's fulfilling enough that I'm doing them that I don't really really feel the need yeah to but you're the guy that I mean, doesn't I'm not have a, to because i just like your not post there in front of a fire and a glass of whiskey that's perfect that's me see like yeah that's and that's yeah i don't want anybody to take away anything other than hey this, that that guy he's just him he's just himself he's just yeah. that's jack there's rex rex. That's, rex that's rex that's rex right know, there. he's got his glass of whiskey in front of the fire i can't believe we didn't talk about stick. whiskey at all during this that was one no. of my main well, we questions about he sent my coast you know he sent dave whiskey doesn't send me. Well, I sent Dave a flag. Well, I still. sent you something better. Well, I know. Uh, what am I? Not, uh, let's, am let's, I not, wait, let's be honest. You got the better end of that deal. Oh, <laughs> just like a box of nude pictures? Oh, I'm not, I can I'm, either confirm I'm or deny. I'm wiping my chin right now. Oh. I can either confirm um, or deny. So, like, you can just tell me when you're going to send me a present. <laughs> Get right on See that? Like, oh, you've got a fan club here. I don't know. I've, a, a burgeoning fan club. I love it. I, maybe an OnlyFans isn't off the table at No, you it have, isn't. You know, two or three subscribers at least. At least. <laughs> well, that's all you yeah, need at 1995. I quit my day month. job. Who needs this shit? Oh, my. I'm going to quit my day yeah. job. I pay tens of dollars a week. <laughs> I'm telling you. I tell you. Yeah. You just never know. Well, that's right. we've got... Uh, Jack Wells here, and you need to get his new book so that he doesn't have to work and he doesn't have to do an OnlyFans. It's I called Jack of it. All Trades. But mind you, we we do like to see the OnlyFans, so maybe <laughs> don't buy it. <laughs> well, Jack, thank you. Thank you, Rex. Thank hey, you, Rex. thanks for having me again. This oh, was... Rex. I'll have you anytime oh, you want. Rex. Oh, Rex. I, yeah, there you, you are go. fantastic. Oh, do it again sometime, would you? Yeah. Oh, my. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.